In the previous video, I pro made a promise that I'll offer some tips on how to use integration by parts properly. And so I now want to fulfill that promise. So integration by parts should only be used if the following conditions hold uh, in your integral. So first of all, the integrand has to be it has to be written as a product of two things. There's got to be a product of some kind. Uh, you're going to see it's got to be the product of u and dv. You have to have two factors. Now, admittedly, this first condition, well, most of the times we'll be thinking integration by parts because, oh, we, we naturally see two factors. In the previous example, we saw e times, sorry, x times e to the 5x. It had that natural factorization right here. Now, in, in other examples we'll see in this video, the, the factorization will be obvious. Now, in some situations, though, if you have a function f of x and the factorization is not obvious, well, admittedly, you should always look at the dx. The dx is part of that. And sometimes that's the factorization you use. You use f of x times dx. Um, and that might seem like, well, how is that ever going to be helpful? But we'll see some examples exactly when it is. So the, don't focus on the first one too much, but we do have to think of how it's going to factor. Now, because there are some options on how one factors it, how do you choose u and how do you choose dv? Well, principle b here, um, it should be possibly, we have, to, we have to be able to integrate dv. You can't choose dv to be such and such if you can't integrate it. That'll get you stuck. And we have to also differentiate u. So however you choose u and dv, we should be able to find the derivative of u. We should be able to find the antiderivative of dv. If you're missing one of those pieces, integration by parts isn't going to get you any farther than you've already done. So we have to find the derivative. We have to be able to find the integral of the appropriate parts. And then this third principle is the one that matters the most. The integral of v du has to be found. We have to be able to compute this new integral that's going to pop up. Generally speaking, the integral of v du should be simpler than what we started with. Um, it shouldn't be more complicated, but it is possible that if our integral is uh, no more complicated than we started with, it turns out if you kick the can down the road long enough, we live on a round planet. If you kick the can down the road long enough, you'll make a big circle. Um, and it turns out I'll show you a variation of integration by parts, which I call integration by cycles. Um, that could show you that even if this thing is no worse than you started, that's actually still a step in the right direction. But let's look at two examples of how a typical integration by parts calculation works. We have an integral. Uh, we want to integrate the function x sine of x dx. There's a natural factorization. We have this x times sine of x. The dx is always going to go with the dv, so that's not too much in subject here. Uh, there's no question about that. The question is where do we put the x, where do we put the sine? Now, we have to choose someone to integrate, which we call u. We have to choose someone to integrate, which we call dv. Now, if you look at x, if we take the integral, or if we take the integral of x, we're going to get an x squared, you know, up to a constant multiple. But if we take the derivative, we're going to get a 1. x disappears if you take its derivative, but it gets more complicated if you take its antiderivative. That right there seems to suggest to me that I should set x equal to u. But let's, let's see what's going on with the other side of things. What about sine? If you take the derivative of sine, you get a cosine. And if you take the antiderivative of sine, you get a negative cosine. So you're going to get a plus or minus cosine no matter what you choose. So in some respect, it doesn't matter where the sine goes, the derivative or antiderivative. You're going to end up with a constant multiple of a cosine. Um, and the linearity property of, of antiderivatives tells you the sine doesn't, the, the plus or minus sign doesn't matter. And so because of that, it doesn't matter where you put the sign, but it does matter where we put the x. We can simplify if we take the derivative of x. We complicate if we take the antiderivative of x. And so that's going to guide our hand here. We're going to set u equal to x, and hence du will equal dx. And we're going to set dv to be sine of x dx. Don't forget the dx there. And then v is going to equal, like I said before, negative cosine of x. And so if we use that choice for integration by parts, uh, Remember, integration by parts, the formula is the integral of u dv will equal uv minus the integral of v du. So putting those parts all together here, we end up with x times negative cosine of x minus, pay attention to the minus signs here, we're going to get integral of v, which is negative cosine. You have to be very cautious here because the derivative and antiderivative of the sine is very similar. We have to be very cautious. Should we have a plus or a minus in front of my cosine? Um, in this case, since we're taking antiderivative, it should be a negative cosine. So V is negative cosine. Then we get du. Du is just an x. 
So notice here, if we simplify this, we get negative x cosine of x. That part of the antiderivative is already done. We took that part. Then we get a plus integral of cosine of x. So if we look at the last principle, are we in a better situation than we were before? Can we find the antiderivative of cosine? And the answer is, yep, uh, the antiderivative of cosine is a sine. And so taking the antiderivative there, we get negative x cosine of x uh, plus sine of x plus a constant. And do notice it'll be a positive sign because we're taking the antiderivative of cosine, not the derivative of cosine. And you could verify by usual derivative techniques that the derivative of negative x cosine x plus sine of x plus a constant is in fact x sine of x. And so we were able to use those guidelines for integration of parts to help us uh, find the antiderivative. We chose um, u and dv to make the integral simpler and the new integral was something we could calculate. Uh, let's look at another example. This time, let's look at the integral of 2x squared e to the negative 3x. So we see this natural factorization. There's a factor of x squared. There's a factor of e to the negative 3x. The dx will always go with the dv, and then the 2 can go wherever we want because it's a constant multiple. Uh, so we have to choose a u, and we have to choose a dv. Now, generally speaking, putting monomials for u is a good idea because when you take the derivative of a monomial, um, it's, it's always going to be a monomial, and oftentimes it'll be a simpler monomial. That is, the power will be smaller. Um, on the other hand, the e to the negative 3x, kind of like sine, it doesn't really matter where you put it. If you take the derivative of e to the negative three x, you're gonna get a negative three times the exponential again. If you take the antiderivative of it, uh, so if we take e to the negative three x dv for ex dx, for example, its antiderivative is gonna be a negative one third e to the negative three x. And so when you, whether you take the derivative or the antiderivative of this exponential, you're gonna get a constant multiple of that same exponential. And although we might prefer uh, integer over a fraction here, um, constant multiples don't make much of a, they don't have much of a consequence on the integration. So whether you take the derivative or antiderivative of the exponential, you're gonna get the same thing. You'll get an exponential again. But by placing the power function 2x squared in for u, when you take its derivative du, you're gonna get 4x dx. You'll notice that the power of x goes down by one. And so applying this to integration by parts, we end up with a u times v, so we're gonna get negative two thirds x squared e, that doesn't look like an e, e to negative three x. Now we're gonna subtract the integral of v, which was negative one third e to negative three x times du, which is four x dx, like so. Uh, simplifying the integral, we end up with negative two thirds x squared e to the negative three x. I didn't do anything to that. We're gonna get a plus four thirds integral of x e to the negative three x dx. So does this new integral put us in a better position than we were before? And I would say the answer is yes, right? Could we find the integral, the antiderivative of x e to the negative three x? Well, maybe I don't know it off the top of my head, but it's like, well, we could just use integration by parts again, right? Could we do it a second time? Where say u equals x, so du equals dx, and dv would equal e to the negative three x dx, and hence v would equal again, negative one third e to the negative three x. Because if we were to do integration by parts a second time, the power of x will go down one more time and eventually this process will end. Because we had an x squared to begin with, we have to do integration by parts twice. If we had like x to the 12th, we could do it 12 times. That would be a long exercise. I didn't assign one that big. But in principle, we could reduce the power of x by doing integration by parts over and over and over and over again. Eventually the power of x will disappear. And so if we do that, we're just gonna copy the piece we had before the negative two thirds x squared e to the negative three x. Uh, now we're gonna get plus four thirds and make sure this four thirds distributes on both parts because this integral will be replaced with two parts. We have a new u and v, which is gonna be negative one third x e to the negative three x. And then we're gonna subtract from it the integral. Uh, we're gonna get v again, which is now negative one third e to the negative three x times dx. 
like so. So in this situation, do distribute the four thirds onto both pieces here. And so we have two parts of the integral calculated. We have the negative two thirds, x squared, e to the negative three x. That part's just on for the journey this time. It's not gonna change. We now get a negative four ninths x, e to the negative three x. And we have a positive four ninths integral of e to the negative three x dx. And so since we're using integration by parts twice, we didn't have to ask ourselves the question a second time. Is this last integral in a better position than we were before? And the answer is yes. We've now integrated e to the negative three x twice now. We know it's antiderivative is gonna be a negative one third e to the negative three x. And so applying that, we get all of this one more time, negative two thirds x squared times e to the negative three x, negative four ninths x e to the negative three x. And then we're gonna get a minus four over 27. I'm taking four thirds times negative one third e to the negative three x and don't forget your plus c. And this gives us our antiderivative. All right. I'm gonna put a nice box on it, maybe a bow for Christmas time because it's just so wonderful. That's my pretty bow right there. Um, and we get, we get our antiderivative. Now, integration by parts is a technique that we do by parts. Imagine you have this six foot sub sandwich you have to eat. No one's gonna eat it all in one bite. Therefore, you have to take small bites, bite after bite after bite. That'll get you through the entire problem. Some can be done in two bites. Some, like in this one, can be done in three bites. And more complicated ones can be done in, multi in much more bites if you had to. This process can be iterated by doing it over and over again until all the powers of X are exhausted.